Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting for August 11th, 2020. Hope folks are doing well and maybe had a chance to participate in Black Hat or DEF CON virtual events last week. While we miss seeing folks out in Vegas, the Metasploit team hosted our own annual open source security meetup last week with some fun speakers, both from the community and from the team itself. You can check out the live stream recording up on the Metasploit YouTube channel if you missed it. Um, the, this demo meeting this week should be an exciting one. Got some big announcements uh, with Spencer McIntyre from the research team covering the framework bits here. It's going to be good, so let's hop in. Hello, everyone. Let's talk about framework. All right, so we have a lot of content to go over. And first up, we want to talk about some of the new modules. Uh, so the Flow Zero uh, provided us with a use after free privilege escalation in FreeBSD. Uh, we also had a Balder botnet panel shell upload exploit by I can't, I'm going to butcher this name, Egg Bal Balchi. I hope, uh, hope that was correct. Um, this was interesting because it provides uh, unauthenticated attackers RCE into this uh, botnet panel script. So you can take a look at that. Um, I provided a SharePoint uh, deserialization vulnerability. This one got a little bit of attention. It was kind of glossed over because it came out at about the same time that the SIG red DNS vulnerabilities. It is an authenticated uh, code execution, but it is also remote. Um, so that module is in the framework. And then a second uh, PR was uh, submitted by Egg Balchi, um, which is the uh, Telegram message client. And I do believe that we will be having a demo of that in just a little bit. Uh, but wait, there's even more new modules. Uh, we also had a Docker privilege uh, container escape uh, that was contributed by community member Stealthcopter. Uh, we will be having a demo of that. Um, and a file format vulnerability in uh, the Documolis free PDF editor. Um, there was a stack buffer overflow contributed by uh, Metacom27. Uh, we got a very interesting uh, vulnerability in some SCADA infrastructure. That was the CA Unified Infrastructure Management from uh, NIMSoft. Uh, this vulnerability uh, was quite interesting because it's not every day that we see a 64-bit ROP chain contributed uh, to Metasploit. So that was some fantastic work by uh, Wetwork. Uh, who contributed that module. And there was a second uh, container escape. Uh, this was for a different platform. I believe it was the LXC uh, container system that was also contributed by community member uh, Stealthcopter. And then we had uh, quite a few enhancement and features. Uh, I updated the SAP recon uh, module so that way we could have a check method and a remove action so that way the module could be utilized to add and remove accounts. Uh, Hoodie improved uh, the Bloodhound module support. Uh, this included multiple subfixes, uh, one of which updated the uh, binary that was shipped with Metasploit to Sharphound version 3, I believe is the, uh, the latest. Uh, Jay Martin uh, from Rapid7 updated the MSF console to always display the major version. Uh, that allows all of the new users that are running the uh, latest MSF 6 to know they are running uh, Metasploit 6. Uh, Metasploit's uh, Brent Cook uh, updated the open bass scanning uh, to allow importing vulnerabilities that do not have a CVE or a bug ID uh, associated with them. So we get more uh, complete result sets. And a, another uh, contribution by Jeffrey Martin from Rapid7, uh, as was alluded already on the pro side of the announcement, uh, but the dependency on Rails has been upgraded from 4.2 uh, 0.6 to 5.2. So this was a large team effort. So huge props to that. Uh, then we have uh, some bug fixes. Uh, community member uh, Tim Wright updated an issue with the Wayland Gather module where when there was an invalid API key passed to the geolocation, um, there was an issue there that was fixed. Uh, Digital Combine updated the post uh, multi-managed pseudo module to clean up after itself so that way clear text passwords are not being left on the file system uh, within temporary files that were created as part of the, uh, the run operation. Uh, Google Summer of Code mentee uh, Red 0xff updated the HTTP header objects used by the framework to be consistently case insensitive, uh, which is compatible and uh, honors the RFC stating that the HTTP headers are not supposed to be case uh, sensitive. 
And then uh, Grant Wilcox from Rapid7 also fixed an error message when a module was run with uh, no selected payload to provide a better user experience there. All right, so uh, the big announcement is that Metasploit 6 is under active development. Um, we uh, posted a large number of technical details on the Rapid7 blog, in case you missed it, just this uh, most recent past Thursday on the 6th. Um, some highlights there is that we're including end-to-end -end encryption for all of the Meterpreter implementations on all of the transports. They're all going to be utilizing AES encryption with a key that is negotiated over RSA. Um, this is thanks in large part to a tremendous effort from community member uh, O.J. Reeves, who we'd like to extend a huge thank you to. Uh, but that's not all that O.J. brought us. Uh, O.J. also added in cleaner payload artifacts. Uh, so this was a, a number of changes that removed a large volume of static strings that were included within uh, multiple payload artifacts and binaries that were produced uh, by Metasploit. So this is a, a effort to make it a little bit more difficult and complicated to write static signatures to detect some of these things that Metasploit is doing. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Rapid7's Christophe De La Fuente uh, added SMB3 client support to the framework. Uh, this is fantastic because it allows Metasploit to run in environments where SMB3 is the only version of SMB that's used. And it also provides encryption to SMB3 compatible servers. That way all of the SMB3 operations are going to be protected within the encryption that that version of the protocol provides. Uh, we also added in a polymorphic block API stuff for all of the Windows payloads. The, poly, uh, the block API, if you're not familiar with it, accounts for up to about half of the volume of shell code for some of the Windows stagers. And up until recently, it was a static stub. And so we updated that into a polymorphic variant that's going to be generated and randomized each time to further complicate the process of writing signature-based detections for artifacts that Metasploit is uh, generating. Man, that's quite the list. Yes, it is. It's been a it's been a busy busy. I want to say a few weeks, but it was it was a lot longer than that. So huge thanks to everyone. This was a large team effort. So huge thanks to everyone who contributed into this effort. All right. And so uh, for more information on the uh, Metasploit highlights, uh, the blog Rapid Seven has the weekly updates, which will have more information about the the features and bug fixes that we had mentioned, and also the Metasploit V6 announcement is posted up onto there. And uh, don't forget, uh, as was mentioned uh, with the Metasploit v6, it introduces some breaking changes for payloads that were generated with version 5. Uh, those version 5 payloads are not going to connect to version 6 and vice versa. So don't upgrade to Metasploit v6 during active operations. Um, you're going to need to regenerate any payload binaries you had previously generated. Yeah, and just to your point, Spencer, too, there is a there's a there's a blog post with with more, some more of that detail about the the Metasploit six release up on the on the website, the blog rapid seven dot com website there. And yep, yep. Uh, our, our our again, you know, we really appreciate everybody who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions to the project. And so there's pushing, thanking, thank you. <laughs> All right, is it time for demo, Spencer? I believe it is. All right. All right, so first up, uh, we have Grant Wilcox showing some of the new Telegram notifications. Grant, are you on the line? Yep, I am. Wonderful. Yeah, so this was uh, one of the things that we try and do in Metasploit is that we try and have a couple of different options to alert users to when they get a session. Um, some of the older ones were SMB, sorry, were SMS and like text-based notifications, but with the advent of new uh, messaging platforms, we thought it would be good to add a couple of newer ones like Telegram. So this is just the module here. We're just going to go ahead and set a couple of options that automatically runs a script. That script will essentially set up the API key and all of the other settings needed to properly communicate with Telegram server. So I'm just going to run the exploit here. Um, now, what we're going to do is just hop over to my Windows machine and run the exploit. Um, and we should see that now we are getting a session notified notification um, to say that the new session has been opened. So this is just a really simple way to go, hey, if you've got a Telegram um, client on your phone and you want to be notified when a new session is opened, 
just as part of a pen test engagement or whatnot, instead of waiting and then having to go to your computer and constantly check it, you can just get a notification on your phone when this session opens. I'm gonna skip, I'll skip, skip back to the, the exciting part there. Hey, notification, cool. Awesome, thank you, Grant. Okay, cool. Uh, well, then next up we have Brendan Waters, who's going to be going over some new changes to the networking gather infrastructure for a few modules that are included in the framework. Brendan, are you ready? Yep. Uh, also, my apologies on the confusion. This is a uh, micro tick uh, change to the networking gather group. Uh, you are absolutely right in talking about the uh, some changes that are coming up for the networking gather group. We found a bug on a lot of those and uh, we already have a PR. I'll be testing that this week and hopefully landing it in. But in this case, uh, community contributor hoodie set up a new uh, networking gather module uh, so that it will work with MicroTik routing. Uh, MicroTik is uh, a routing manufacturer uh, out of Latvia, I believe. Um, and it, this, takes a gather module and goes ahead and runs several commands on it. It's, uh, as you can see here, I'm just connecting into a MicroTik device. The uh, default password for this particular device is blank. So I had to enable blank passwords. Um, you get an interesting shell on a MicroTik device. And so uh, in this particular case, it already has all of the uh, commands that you need. Um, and so it'll go ahead and run the commands to get the necessary files and go through all of them. You can see we've got a host because we successfully did a uh, SSH login scan. We're running the, uh, the uh, gather module. It's pulling the data. You can see uh, it's running several commands. Now, when we go and take another look at the hosts, everything's populated here, or at least a lot of the stuff is populated, and you've got data to run off of for, uh, for the host. Any questions? Awesome, thank you, Brendan. I'm sorry for getting that confused with the other uh, network gathering changes. No worries, there's been a lot fly flying back and forth on that. All right, uh, next up is me with the SharePoint RCE. All right, so like I mentioned, uh, this is a very interesting vulnerability, kind of got overlooked because it was released around the same time as the SAP Recon and the SIG Red DNS vulnerability. Uh, this is an authenticated code execution within SharePoint. Uh, that can be leveraged by either creating or accessing existing content that could be tripped into deserializing .NET uh, binary code that would result in an operating system command being executed. Uh, so huge props to Stephen Seeley who created the XML gadget chain that was necessary to exploit this and uh, Saroshi Dalali that uh, also confirmed that the vulnerability could be exploited without uh, putting additional content onto the server. Um, it allows this Metasploit module uh, uses that technique and it allows it to provide a much cleaner experience because we're not dropping um, any additional unnecessary artifacts onto the server that would then need to be cleaned up. So here we've gone through, we uh, have uploaded and executed our 64-bit interpreter, and we have code execution running within the context of the user that uh, is running SharePoint. So that was that local administrator, but then here below, we drop down and we check to see uh, the membership of the user that we use to exploit SharePoint, and that was just a domain user. So those are not necessarily the same. Um, so it did look like in SharePoint under the default configuration, while you did have to be authenticated, a domain user would be uh, sufficient for that. Okay, cool. Uh, I think we are back to Brendan for one of the uh, container escape exploits. Certainly. In this particular case, this is another uh, module sent to us by uh, StealthCopter. Uh, in this particular case, it's a Docker privilege escape container. So the container itself has to be a privileged container. Um, and so once you run, uh, in this particular case, uh, I'm setting up the callback. 
uh, on the other side of the screen in just a second, I'll be running a, uh, a payload inside the privileged container. This is the callback for the, for the uh, payload running inside the privileged container. There we go. So you can see we're running inside the latest Ubuntu here. Uh, and we're running as a uh, root inside uh, that particular machine. Now we're going to break out of it. Or sorry, we're running as root in that particular container. Now we're going to break out of that container onto the other machine. And uh, sorry, sorry about the puff. Okay, and so uh, we'll go ahead and set the uh, listener for that, or set the payload for it. By the way, this uh, abuses the C group notification to break out. Okay, we've got everything set up, set the session. We get our new session back, and that's the external. And we're still root. That's pretty cool. All right, uh, it's back over to uh, me for uh, a demonstration of the SMB3 client. We're going to be utilizing the PS exec here for this. Uh, this demo runs a little bit long. Uh, would you mind, Pierce, in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, running it in double time? Sure. Yeah. Me... Uh, for all of those of you that are watching, um, this is also available, is linked to from the Metasploit 6 blog with a, a little bit more uh, technical detail. And uh, it kind of goes over some of the uh, inner workings of, of what's going on. So you can watch the full version there. But I'm going to narrate here as we... Uh, go through this one to keep us on track. Sorry. We're going to be walking through a scenario in which this might actually... All right, uh, so we are going to be using the, S, uh, the SMB PS exec module, uh, which was one of the many ones that were updated to utilize uh, the new Ruby stack, which allows us to work with both versions one, two, and the latest version three. Um, and we're going to run a command, which is going to help demonstrate an instance where the transport encryption is going to provide additional value to the user. It's going to allow us to encrypt our Mimikatz command. Uh, so this command that we're going to use is we're going to go ahead and we're going to download and invoke the PowerShell script from the Empire project to dump out the credentials. Now, this is not something that you would want to have transferred in plain text across the network. But in this case, because we're using uh, the latest changes, we're going to have that transport level of encryption uh, as we're running this command on the remote server and then downloading all of the results. Uh, so in order to run that command, uh, we set the new target to the new command target and we set the payload to the CMD Windows generics. So that way we can specify our own command. Um, we're setting up all the additional options from there, uh, pretty much uh, the defaults. Now we know this command does take a few seconds to run. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna set the command delay to 10 and that just kind of gives Mimikatz a few seconds to run there. In, uh, in the background, it's a little bit slow. It's not quite instantaneous. And then we see here all of our secrets were recovered from the remote memory using Mimikatz that we would expect. Um, and we had Wireshark running in the background to kind of ensure that we uh, are running our encryption. So if we note in here, we can see where our connection is authenticated and it switches over then to an encrypted SMB3 connection. And we can look through those individual frames and we never see the plain text uh, credentials from Mimikatz that we would have seen with an older version or had we not been able to utilize the new SMB3 changes. So now this was all done by default. Uh, we are encrypting the connections to uh, SMB3 servers that we're connecting to by default. Uh, but if you want to force a downgrade to a previous version, we introduced the new SMB protocol version option, which we can see set here. 
we're gonna go ahead and set it back to two to kind of emulate the older functionality of the framework. And we're gonna clear Wireshark and run this again. And it's gonna show an alternative where now we don't have all of that encryption of uh, the communications and the output uh, from the sensitive Mimikatz command. So we're still waiting here. And then once we have that output, we can actually search through it and see that we can find uh, the, the string of uh, Benjamin Delpy's name marking the uh, plain text output from Mimikatz that wasn't protected on the network. Uh, so this, along with the encryption changes that were incorporated into Meterpreter, kind of starts one of the uh, trends that Metasploit 6 is trying to be secure by default, encrypting the connections that it, it is using uh, where applicable. Uh, so now all the modules that support SMB3, when the target server supports it, we're going to have that encrypted connection to be able to protect the data, uh, the user's data in transit. Um, so does anybody have any questions on that? Cool. Well, I think that was the last demo. Um, all of the SMB3 connections uh, work was implemented by Christoph, so I wanted to send a huge shout out and thank you to Christoph for the tremendous amount of effort that he put into that. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I think that uh, concludes the uh, framework section. Thanks for bearing with me, everyone. Yeah. So well, thank you, Spencer. I really appreciate all that content and, the, and, and thank you everybody for the demos. That was fantastic. Um, we're going to roll into uh, our update on attacker KB or the attacker knowledge base, hacker data at community scale. Uh, attackerkb.com is where you can learn about and discuss which phones matter and why. Um, check it out. I think we have a demo today from our own James Barnett um, around our updates to references that the team has made. James, you wanna, I'm gonna stop my share. Yeah. All right, so um, this is kind of a, uh, it's not really a work in progress. It, it's not uh, live yet, but it's coming very soon. But um, this is around some re-architecture we made to the references section of a topic, which references is supposed to be a place where you can put like links to uh, related information, like maybe the security advisory or um, you know, like maybe a blog post or, or something like that, that uh, gives more information about the particular CVE or vulnerability. Um, I'm on, this is master right now. This is live prod. Um, I just wanted to show like what the references currently looks like. So you go into a new topic or, or edit an existing topic and there's just a text box and it allows you to put in URLs here. Um, I'm not going to actually create this because it's prod, but, uh, you know, you just put in your URL here and, or, or you can put in like a CVE ID, uh, just, raw and uh, this will, it'll take this too. I actually think it'll take any string. Um, so there's no validation or anything here. Um, and yeah, and then you save it and that's it. It's basically just a uh, collection of strings that lives within the metadata of the topic. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make uh, references more of a first class citizen. Um, that way we could treat things like CVEs and um, <laughs> Uh, like the uh, MS uh, IDs and stuff like that as, as true uh, canonical uh, references for the um, for the topic and then also uh, allow all users to create um, references uh, on a topic right now only uh, admins or the person who created a topic can actually um, edit these so yeah that's where these changes came from so um, this is uh, on my local branch. This is on my machine. Um, this is just the blue keep exploit. Uh, if you come in here um, in the vulnerability details, you'll see there's a new references section. Well, I, the references section was already there, but it's now always there, even if there's no references. And there's now an add reference button. Um, so now you can set a description of what the reference is, uh, what the URL is, and then you can choose a type. So they'll show up in categories. So I'm just going to create a test uh, reference. And then I'll submit it. And now it shows up here um, in the list. So anybody can do this. I'm not logged in as an admin right now. So anybody can come in and add references as needed. Uh, the person who created the reference can delete them. That way, like, we can't have people maliciously deleting other people's references or admins can delete everything. 
Um, so yeah, you can add like a CVE. I don't actually. Um, and that, that's a canonical reference. So um, store that one. And then uh, it shows up here in a different list. Um, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six categories right now, but we can expand these as needed. Um, what else? There's also some validations in here and a little error message. If you don't put in a URL, it'll tell you what you did wrong. Um, if you don't put in a valid URL, uh, it will complain that a valid URL is needed. Um, that's pretty much it. So, uh, oh yeah, I should delete too. Um, So yeah, the, the goal of this is to make it so everybody can add references and that you don't have to add references through like creating a new topic or editing the topic or even adding them through a, an assessment. Um, like I said, this isn't live yet, but it should be coming soon, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Is there any questions? I'll point out too that the that the team pushed uh, recently another uh, update out to the to prod, um, so it's publicly available. That has some nice little, uh, let's say, small quality of life improvements um, for you know general usage. Uh, just to just to let folks raise awareness to the up on the release notes of the website. There, you can you can see specifically what those are if anybody want you know wants to see them. But and James pulls them there. They uh, they have um, yeah there you go. Um, so there's just some in there that, uh, you know, the you know, stuff that'll make, make things a little, little more, uh, I think smooth. So nice, nice stuff there. Yeah. There's some high, highly requested by a certain someone feature for, uh, when you click the cancel button, it doesn't leave in your, uh, your, any text that you entered. Um, also hovering over a badge will show, uh, information about what the badge actually contains, which is something that was requested a lot. A lot of people were confused about what the score or what the, the badges actually meant. Um, switching between these tabs uh, on like the vulnerability details will now um, actually update the URL. So when you copy paste it, it takes you to the right place. Um, just a lot of little stuff that we tried to get in based on feedback. Cool. All right, last call for any questions, comments, attacker KB. I had a, a quick question. Do um, do adding new references or adding new tags show up in the activity feed, or is that something you still need to go look at the um, uh, topic to see if it changed? You have to look at the topic. We don't have topic updates in the uh, activity feed yet. We have that on the backlog to get in soon, but um, I don't know when it's scheduled for. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Excellent.